This is Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States of America. On September the 13th, 1759, young General James Wolfe, at the head of a British military force, climbed to the top of the Plains of Abraham, which overlooks the city of Quebec, some 390 miles up there to the north, and virtually smashed French power on the North American continent. General Wolfe died on that battlefield, and the seeds of the American War of Independence or the American Revolution were sown. One of the main reasons that the 13 American colonies had stood united with Great Britain was because of the imperial threat of France to conquer British North America. But now, thanks to dead General Wolfe and his British soldiers, that threat, and sadly that unity, born out of American colonial fear of France, was gone. Of course, there were wise and strong Britishers, and there were wise and strong American colonials who wanted that old family unity preserved. On the one hand, Britain had its great William Pitt, and on the other hand, the American colonies had their great Benjamin Franklin and such like. Unfortunately, on October the 25th, 1760, King George II of Great Britain dropped dead while drinking a cup of hot chocolate. And what was to prove even more unfortunate, his young grandson, aged 22 years, immediately became King George III. From that moment, both the Americans and we British were in serious trouble. You see, George III hankered after the old divinity of kingship. And he, to First Minister William Pitt's astonishment, set about dismantling pieces of the British Constitution. George III assembled around him the politicians who could be tempted into becoming courtiers. And His Majesty attracted the politicians who were envious of William Pitt's monumental achievements. It should be remembered that William Pitt had been chiefly responsible politically for making this very small island of Britain the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Anyway, uh, these royal renegades to the evolving democratic constitution of Britain were known as the King's Party. And during October 1761, they forced William Pitt to resign his great administration. And William Pitt's physical health deteriorated. Here again, in a man's disintegrating health, were seeds of the American War of Independence. And by 1763, the awful door to royal dictatorship in Britain was pretty well unguarded. And George III began to fumble his way through. Amongst other things, he inspired a stamp tax to be applied to the American colonies. And a mutiny act was in operation to uphold that tax, should anyone on the North American continent think of objecting. And then His Majesty went potty, stark staring mad. Well, there were quite a few people here in the American colonies who objected to that stamp tax and to that mutiny bill. In very particular, Mr. Samuel Adams, well-known inhabitant of this city of Boston and the sometime British colony of Massachusetts. Mr. Samuel Adams was an extreme radical, and he had a fundamental rule in life. Put your adversary in the wrong and keep him there. 
Sam Adams is a candidate for being the most lethal political operator in the history of America. And that I know is saying something. The question that Sam Adams aggressively posed was, why should the American colonies be told to pay anything? The short answer to that is that Britain had just finished fighting a seven years war, not least of all for the protection of the American colonies, mainly from French aggression. And now Britain felt that the American colonies must help to pay for their own future safety. Sam viewed the new stamp tax, and he grasped the incipient wrong, which he expressed as, no taxation without representation, and he shouted it with proper revolutionary fervor. And of course, it is true that there were no Americans in the British Parliament here in London, uh, where the Stamp Act was passed. Difficult, mind you, with 3,000 odd miles of ocean separating colonists from Parliament and only sailing ships. Sam lit his flame of radical discontent and it was comparable to a laser beam. He set about rousing and frightening, first of all, the Bostonians with dreadful prophecies. He said, if our trade may be taxed, why not our lands? This we apprehend annihilates our charter right. To govern and tax ourselves, it strikes at our British privileges. And then Sam exploded with delight. What a blessing to us is the Stamp Act. Eventually, the other American colonies will see the common target and at the same time, they will see our mutual colonial dependence. So, dear friends, in spite of George III, one can't help feeling a bit sorry for the fumbling old country. I mean Britain. It meant no offense, but there were certain American patriots determined to take offense. Apart from Sam up here in Boston, uh, there was another lad named Patrick Henry down south here in the old colony of Virginia, who very early in the game had shouted, when a king degenerates into a tyrant, he forfeits all right to obedience. And after that treasonable public statement, he confided to a witness that he had said what he had said, only to render myself popular. Well, popularity is one thing, but you can also start a revolution that way. However, the stamp tax was now an established legal fact, and here in Williamsburg, the Burgesses of Virginia met to decide what should be done, if anything. But initially, no one positively moved. Hardly a peep out of one gentleman who was present, named George Washington. And incidentally, leaning in this doorway was a young man named Thomas Jefferson. The date was May the 29th, 1765. It happened to be Patrick Henry's 29th birthday. He waited impatiently, no doubt, for the distinguished statesman to speak up. Nothing. Patrick Henry couldn't bear it any longer, and so he began. Resolved, therefore, that the General Assembly of this colony have the only and sole exclusive right and power to lay taxes and impositions upon the inhabitants of this colony. There were finally five of these resolves. They are known as the Virginia Resolves. They were printed and hastened south and, most significantly, north. Up here in Boston, Sam Adams gave a war cry of fulfillment. And by the 14th of August, on the strength of those Virginia resolves and the Southern solidarity personified by Patrick Henry, he had a big riot going. Sam Adams said of that riot, it ought to be forever remembered in America because the people shouted and their shout was heard to the distant ends of this continent. The happy day on which liberty arose from a long slumber. Sam Adams' followers, whom he called uh, Mohawks, 
though there was not a red Indian allowed within smoke signaling distance, screamed, liberty and property! A deeply significant slogan for emerging America, liberty and property. And the governor of Massachusetts named Bernard said, when they shout liberty and property, it is the usual notice of their intention to plunder and pull down an house. And indeed, that is precisely what they did. Sam, sons of liberty, hastened to the home of the distinguished Bostonian Thomas Hutchinson, who was the Chief Justice of Massachusetts, and destroyed everything they could lay their hands on including Hutchinson's famous collection of American historical documents. Hutchinson had opposed the stamp tax, but nevertheless, Sam Adams considered him guilty of one awful offense, that he was loyal to his oath of allegiance to the British crown. The terrible truth is that from that time, loyalty became a dangerous word in the American colonies. Particularly through Massachusetts, a monstrous witch hunt evolved against all men and women who remained loyal to the home country of Britain. And Samuel Adams was the overriding influence behind that reign of terror. But fortunately, there were people who saw the simple truth of America's predicament, the threat to America's democratic rights, and who took more honorable action. For instance, over here in Britain, William Pitt, still very sick, attended the British House of Commons. And in physical pain, he got to his feet and said, It is a long time, Mr. Speaker, since I have attended in Parliament. When the resolution was taken in this House to tax America, I was ill in bed. If I could have endured to have been carried in my bed, I would have solicited some kind hand to have laid me down on this floor to have borne my testimony against it. It is my opinion that this kingdom has no right to lay a tax upon the American colonies. They are the subjects of this kingdom equally entitled with yourselves to all the natural rights of mankind and the peculiar privileges of Englishmen. The Americans are the sons, not the bastards of England. There is an idea in some that the colonies are virtually represented in this house. I would fain know by whom an American is represented here. At the same time, this kingdom as the supreme governing and legislative power has always bound the colonies by her laws in everything except that of taking their money out of their pockets without their consent. Here, I would draw the line. I rejoice that America has resisted. Three millions of people so dead to all feelings of liberty as voluntarily to submit to be slaves would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest. Hmm? A gentleman has asked, a gentleman, when were the colonies emancipated? I desire to know when they were made slaves. I will beg leave to tell the House what is really my opinion. It is that the Stamp Act should be repealed absolutely, totally, and immediately. And as the sick William Pitt sat down, he was heard to repeat, 
except that of taking their money out of their pockets without their consent. It was Sam Adams' American cry. No taxation without representation being repeated here in London, and it was being repeated by the great commoner himself, William Pitt. And the bitter debate continued until finally an American was called before the House of Commons here in London. The American described himself as Franklin of Philadelphia. He was asked, can anything less than a military force carry the Stamp Act into execution? Well, they cannot force a man to take stamps who chooses to do without them. They will not find a rebellion, but they may indeed make one. Oh, Franklin's prophetic soul. If the act is not repealed, what do you think will be the consequences? The total loss of the respect and affection the people of America bear to this country. And he added with more than a nod and a wink. And, of course, the total loss of commerce that depends on that respect and affection. Well, that did it. It is only proper to remind our American cousins that we British originally taught them a respect for trade. Anyway, on March the 18th, 1766, the Stamp Act was repealed. King George was livid. As he signed the repeal, he muttered, it is a fatal compliance. But all was far from being well at the very heart of the American question. Here in England, William Pitt was disintegrating in health. And on July the 28th, 1766, the great commoner, as he was called, accepted an earldom. He became the Earl of Chatham. And those many people on both sides of the Atlantic who were fighting for democracy saw his elevation to the House of Lords as a disastrous omen. And so it proved to be. It was the opportunity of the royal influence once again. New taxes on the American colonies were pushed through the British Parliament. Of course, here in Boston, Sam Adams understood perfectly what had taken place in the vicinity of uh, George III. His propaganda machine, his sons of liberty or mohawks, carried hair-raising prophecies north and south. Sam said, these taxes are small specimens of what the British Parliament is planning to send against America. Horrid slavery is on the way. Here's to the speedy removal of all British vermin from America. And finally, trembling and in great agitation, Sam shouted loud and clear, If you are a man, behave like men. Let us take up arms and seize all of the king's officers. Governor Bernard of Massachusetts sent an urgent message to King George III in Britain. Send troops to rescue this government out of the hands of a trained mob. The British establishment was angry but not impressed. General Gage, a distinguished soldier who was favored by the king, summed up Sam Adams and his ilk thus. I am very much of the opinion that they will shrink on the day of trial. There are people who have ever been very bold in council, but never remarkable for their feats in action. And General Gage was proven to be right, uh, for the time being. During October 1768, British troops from Nova Scotia and Ireland began to land at Boston. They marched through the town with their drums beating and their flags flying to this Faneuil Hall. Not a son of liberty so much as coughed in opposition. However, Sam Adams looked at the British soldiers and he knew that he must work very hard, very quickly, and this he did. 
He pumped out anti-British propaganda, usually unadulterated lies, non-stop. He insisted that British soldiers were guilty of brutality against even children, and rape was a valuable card to play. It was all generally untrue. Indeed, British soldiers were given incessant, categorical orders not to give offence under any circumstances, and significantly, never to fire their guns except in desperate self-defence. But, on the other hand, Sam Adams' Sons of Liberty, realising that the British soldiers were careful not to hit back, began to take over Boston once again. The Sons of Liberty continued their terrorist activities against all who opposed them. That is, against the Loyalists. Finally, Governor Bernard was forced to confess. Samuel Adams is in full possession of the government. And then additional help came to Sam from an unexpected quarter. Down here in uh, New York, the local Sons of Liberty thought up a new way of injuring Britain. And that was to boycott, refuse to buy all British goods. It was tremendously effective, and Sam recognized a clever idea and proceeded to build on it. And by August 1768, he was achieving some American colonial unity in this attack on Britain's trade. Indeed, it uh, very seriously hurt the pockets of merchants here in Britain, and thousands of British workers were thrown into unemployment. And that economic trauma was the signal for William Pitt, now Earl of Chatham, to pull his health together and travel once again to the Houses of Parliament here in London. Let us be cautious how we invade the liberties of our fellow subjects, however remote. For be assured, my lords, that in whatever part of the empire you suffer slavery to be established, whether it be in America or in Ireland, you will find it a disease which spreads by contact and soon reaches from the extremities to the very heart. And at that historical juncture, Sam Adams, sensing the noble sentiments of William Pitt, feared that Britain might give America everything that America could ever ask for. He recognized that now or never was the vital time to provoke British soldiers here in Boston into some sort of military action and thereby get his American rebellion underway. On March the 5th, 1770, down there in front of this old state house on King Street, now unhappily called State Street in Boston, Sam Adams, Sons of Liberty as Mohawks, deliberately assembled and began throwing objects at a lone British sentry. This British soldier called for the main guard who appeared and stood their ground. All over Boston, church bells were ringing. It was a pre-planned riot to provoke British soldiers into retaliation. The British stood just over there and defended themselves, but did not fire. And then the Sons of Liberty began to shout that the bloody backs as they called the red-coated British soldiers, were afraid to shoot. One British soldier was knocked to the ground. He picked himself up and fired. And then so did most of the other members of the British military guard. 
five American colonists fell dead or were mortally wounded on this precise spot. This sordid, wretched incident has gone down in American history as the Boston Massacre. It was Sam Adams' greatest victory so far. He was now truly on the road to his bloody goal. Such was Sam Adams' power in Boston at this time that the soldiers who had fired those guns, including their officer, a Captain Preston, were put on trial before a jury of civilians. Sam Adams worked hard to ensure that the soldiers would be found guilty, but he met with brave opposition from an unexpected quarter. Thirty-eight American witnesses came into the court and testified that the Boston Massacre was the culmination of a sinister plot to attack the British soldiers. And what put the tin hat on it was the deathbed confession of the last of the five Americans to die, a Mr. Patrick Carr, who testified that certain townspeople of Boston were the aggressors and that the British soldiers had only fired in self-defense. Samuel Adams never forgave poor dead Patrick Carr. Sam Adams indicted Patrick as an Irish papist and blamed his confession on the Roman Catholic Church and thereby exposed himself as a Puritan bigot of the worst sort. Captain Preston was acquitted by the American civilian jury and only two of the soldiers were found guilty of manslaughter. It was a token verdict. And the judge, whose name was Lynn, stated, I feel myself deeply affected that this affair turns out so much to the shame of the town of Boston in general. But nothing could destroy William Pitt's heroic friendship for America, not even the excesses of Samuel Adams and his Sons of Liberty. On November the 24th, 1770, Pitt spoke again in the House of Lords. Is it that the king, like a stranger in England, knows nothing of its feelings? All that encompassed by the complaints of his people, they neither reach his heart nor his attention. In this conjuncture so critical and so alarming, I hope that something may happen astonishing, stupendous, like a peal of thunder that may open his eyes if they are shut and let in upon his mind the degraded and distracted state of his empire. And finally, William Pitt paid the American colonies perhaps the greatest compliment they have ever received. Pitt said, Were I but ten years younger, I should spend the remainder of my days in America, which has already given the most brilliant proofs of its independent spirit. Of course, Pitt was thinking more of the quality of uh, Franklin, Washington, and Jefferson than the quality of Samuel Adams and Patrick Henry. Benjamin Franklin was to say of William Pitt, that truly great man, I have seen in the course of life sometimes eloquence without wisdom, and often wisdom without eloquence. But in the present instance, I see both united and both in the highest degree possible. And then, during the year 1773, the British government arrived at yet another imperial decision towards America, this time about tea. Royal Britain decided to allow the British East India Company to export tea directly from Asia 
to the American colonies, thereby cutting out the merchant middlemen here in Britain. And on top of this legislation, uh, which obviously made tea cheaper in uh, America, the British government reduced the tax on that tea from one shilling to threepence, which made it even cheaper. The British idea was to undercut and thereby put out of business the American smugglers. But what Britain failed to realize was the enormous significance of the smuggling industry here in America. The American businessmen were the smugglers, and they were enraged at their lost profits. Sam Adams immediately recognized that he had made new and invaluable friends, the American capitalists, and he set about making the most of it. On December the 16th, 1773, Sam rallied several thousand people into this old South meeting house here in Boston and finally declared to them that this meeting can do nothing further to save the country. And that was a clear signal to his sons of liberty, his mohawks, to stop talking and act. They strengthened their instincts with alcohol and hastened to a printing shop where some disguised themselves as genuine Indians and then rampaged down to Boston Harbor where they boarded the moored tea ships and threw 342 chests of finest tea into the water. From one end of the American colonies to the other, many colonists were very impressed by what is called the Boston Tea Party, but not everyone. Uh, down in Virginia, George Washington disapproved of what had been done. George Washington said, whilst we are accusing others of injustice, we should be just ourselves. And over in England, wise Benjamin Franklin called the Boston Tea Party an act of violent injustice. And even William Pitt was outspoken against Sam Adams' mentality. Pitt said, I cannot help condemning in the severest manner the late turbulent and unwarrantable conduct of the American. And what of King George III? Well, he was very angry. He sent for General Gage, who said, Your Majesty, the American colonies will be lions whilst we are lambs. But if we take the resolute part, they'll be very meek. The king immediately recognized a soldier after his own heart and appointed General Gage to be the new governor of Massachusetts. His Majesty came to a speedy decision. He said, you see, my dear Gage, the sovereignty of the king over the colonies requires a full and absolute submission. The New England governments are in a state of rebellion. Blows, blows must decide whether they are to be subject to this country or independent. And so in March 1774, King George retaliated by closing this port of Boston and we British also suppressed the Massachusetts Charter and marched more soldiers into this town, but foolishly not enough to insist on British law and order being upheld here in Massachusetts. Sam Adams shouted for united colonial action. The liberties of all are alike invaded by the same haughty power of England. And so, a momentous decision was proposed to call the first American Continental Congress, the first organized get-together of the political leaders of all the American colonies. It was held in this town of Philadelphia, and Sam, together with all the other emerging leaders of the United American colonies, 
began to move towards each other. Down here in Virginia, tear away Patrick Henry called for conservative George Washington to escort him to Philadelphia, and Mrs. Washington gave Patrick a stiffener, and not that he needed one. Mrs. Washington said, I hope you will stand firm, Mr. Henry. I know George will. And this is where they all met. In this chamber, Patrick Henry stood up and cut through the intercolonial American bickering. He spoke for, amongst others, the unborn Abraham Lincoln. Patrick Henry said, the distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. But sadly, Patrick Henry was to delve into darker and more questionable waters than that demand for American colonial unity. He was to ask, where's France, the natural enemy of Great Britain? Will Louis XVI be asleep all this time? Believe me, no. He will send his fleet and armies to fight our battles for us. He will form with us a treaty offensive and defensive against our natural mother. Can anyone consider Patrick Henry's appeal to the natural enemy of both Britain and the American colonies without some unease? I mean, when we consider how much British blood had recently been spilt protecting the American colonies from France, blood personified by young dead General James Wolfe way up north there at Quebec, well, I'm not happy about it. Oh, but Sam Adams was happy. He stated, this was one of the happiest days of my life. America will make a point of supporting Boston to the act. And then on March the 20th, 1775, here in this St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia, Patrick Henry completed his naked challenge to the men and women of the American colonies and to King George III and all that he stood for. It has been reported that Patrick Henry said, the question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And even conservative Benjamin Franklin, still over here in Britain, was painfully relinquishing the hand of friendship with the home country. Franklin stated, the eyes of all Christendom are now upon us. And if we tamely give up our rights in this contest, we shall be stamped with the character of bastards, poltroons, and fools, and be despised and trampled upon. Not by this haughty, insolent nation only, but by all mankind. And then Franklin assessed the quality of Britain and compared it with the quality and potential of America. When I consider the extreme corruption prevalent among all orders of men in this old rotten state, and the glorious public virtue so predominant in our rising country, I cannot but apprehend more mischief than benefit from a closer union. I fear they may drag us after them. Enormous salaries, bribes, groundless quarrels, false accounts or no accounts. Contracts and jobs devour all revenue and produce continual necessity in the midst of natural plenty. 
I apprehend, therefore, that to unite us intimately with England will only be to corrupt and poison us Americans also. Up here in Boston, Sam Adams openly appealed for a Massachusetts army of 18,000 men. And large quantities of armaments were collected by the colonials. Well, after that, the big question was, what action would General Gage and his British soldiers take? The British intelligence service informed General Gage that the arsenal of incipient rebellion was building up in the town of Concord, some 20 miles to the northwest of Boston, and that not unexpectedly, Sam Adams was very busy in the area around nearby Lexington. On April the 18th, 1775, General Gage dispatched a British task force of 700 soldiers towards Concord to seize the arms of rebellion. At about 5 a.m. on the 19th of April, the British advance guard reached Lexington and faced about 70 armed colonials. Sam Adams had instructed the colonials, make a show of strength, but do not fire. A British officer, a Major Pitkin, rode forward and advised the Americans to disperse. They refused and stood their ground. But it is an interesting fact that our Sam Adams had already taken the precaution of retreating from the immediate danger area. Major Pitcairn gave the order, do not fire, but surround and disarm these men. And as the British soldiers moved to obey, a single shot was fired at them, which missed its target. That fumbled action has gone down in American history as the shot that echoed around the world. The British soldiers reacted by firing back. There were 18 dead and wounded Americans on this Lexington Green. From the safety of nearby Woburn Village, Sam Adams heard that gunfire, but it could not have mattered much to him who was killing who, because he is recorded as simply saying, oh, what a glorious morning is this. The British soldiers hastened to the town of Concord and held the North and South Bridges while British grenadiers set about destroying what armaments they could find. The British piled this captured war equipment in the center of Concord and set fire to it. The armed Americans on the far side of this river quickly but erroneously believed that their houses were being burnt and got very angry. And then from all the towns and villages around here, with names ironically evolved from England, Acton, Bedford, Carlisle, Chelmsford, Lincoln, armed colonists began to converge on the small British force in overwhelming numbers, and the terrible British retreat began. Back the British force came through Lexington and southeastward towards Boston. It has been calculated that something like 20,000 American colonials were reaching for their guns in Massachusetts. The British fought as they retreated. The Americans rarely came into the open. A British officer, Captain Mackenzie, described it thus. We are fired at from all quarters, but particularly from the houses on the roadside and the adjacent stone walls. The soldiers were so enraged at suffering from an unseen enemy 
that they forced open many of the houses and put to death all those found in them. It was an ugly day. At the end of it, when the British were back here in Boston, they had lost 73 killed, 174 wounded, 26 missing. And the American army, for that is what it now was, had lost 49 killed, 39 wounded, and five missing. King George III, Samuel Adams, and Patrick Henry, above all others, had successfully created the American War of Independence. truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 